Good afternoon, and welcome to HealthSystemCIO.com's All-Star Panel, Biometrics Under the Microscope, a webinar tweet chat combo from HealthSystemCIO.com sponsored by Improvada. Just a little housekeeping before we begin. My name is Anthony Guerra. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of HealthSystemCIO.com, and I will be your moderator today. We are having um, a simultaneous tweet chat that's going to be hosted by Managing Editor and Director of Social Media, Kate Gamble. To participate, you're going to want to open a separate browser, uh, or you can do it on your phone by using the hashtag HSCIOChat. And you can view uh, the tweet chat in your media viewer, uh, the WebEx panel, on the right-hand side of your screen. Other WebEx panels that come into play will be the polling panel that will automatically open when we launch our polls today. And if you want to submit a question, you can do that at any time in the Q&A panel. Leave the defaults at the all panelists. So you can send those as they occur to you, and we will take them later on in the program. And you can see uh, the deck URL in front of you if, like, if you'd like to download today's deck, uh, and it will also be sent to you in the chat box. So now we're going to look at our agenda for today. Uh, we are going to go about 35 minutes with our panel discussion featuring Dan Moriel, SVP and CIO at Hunterdon Healthcare. And also we're going to hear from Arthur Ream, Director of Applications and Chief Information Security Officer with Cambridge Health Alliance. So without further delay, we're going to jump into our conversation. Um, Art, so let me start with you. Can you give us uh, an overview of your organization? Sure. Cambridge Health Alliance is a three-hospital system in um, the Cambridge, uh, Somerville, and the Everett uh, area in the city of, uh, you know, in the Boston proper area. We have um, roughly 15 clinics that are not uh, hospital-based clinics, so in other words, they're out in the community. We're the Public Health Commission for the City of Cambridge, uh, Teaching Hospital of Tufts uh, University, and uh, Harvard. We serve a significant uh, behavioral health population as well as a large primary care population uh, and some community outreach with homeless as well uh, in there. Very good. Uh, Dan? Yes, good, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Hunterdon Healthcare System was started in 1953 as an organization to help improve the health of a community. Uh, so um, um, as a healthcare system, we've really been doing population-based health for the better part of 60 years. Um, Hunterdon is a moderate-sized healthcare system, a small hospital with about 200 beds. We do about 30,000 emergency visits a year and just over a million ambulatory uh, visits a year. Uh, we are participating in a variety of ACOs and patient-centered medical homes um, and are very proud uh, of the quality and the level of community care we offer our community. Fantastic. All right. Let's go with our next question. Art, Art let's start with you on this. What types of biometric solutions are you seeing working best in various clinical workflows? So one of the larger biometrical workflows that we actually use at Cambridge Health Alliance is obviously with our three hospital system, we have uh, biometrics on our drug distribution system. So in other words, we have a vendor in here that integrates with our HI, uh, EHR vendor um, that we use biometric fingerprint uh, authentication in order to you know, debit the drugs for the unit doses uh, and partnering that with uh, Non-biometric, but uh, barcode med administration electronically with handhelds. Um, so you end up, you know, addressing the five rights and you solve your access problem. Uh, so all of our drug distribution systems are biometric, fingerprint-based uh, authentication um, on our domain and integrated with our EHR. Very good. We are. Oh, Go sorry. Ahead. 
No, no. We are, we are we are actually exploring uh, and actively engaged um, in the palm vein um, technology, uh, particularly with our sponsor. Um, mm -hmm. We just had a QA uh, yesterday on that across the organization and a return on investment, which we are putting the numbers together now to work on our claims denials and our patient identifications for patient safety and, and, and such as that. So um, the palm vein technology, which works with both of our EHRs, we have Epic and we have Meditech both. Um, we are going to partner with Imperata in the vein scanning and do a pilot program out here um, in primarily both EHRs um, because most of our registrations for the outpatient, I mean outpatient EDs are done in Meditech and not in Epic and the, all of the other registrations are done in Epic. So we have a, a unique situation to ch try this technology across multiple platforms. Uh, in some very key clinical and ED areas. So we're looking actively at that to um, this year put that pilot uh, process in place. Let me just follow up with you, Art. What are you looking for in the pilot? Any specific things come to mind? Well, primarily here we're looking for um, reduce in uh, registration and denials. Um, we do have some cases to where patients do present uh, with the credentials of a family member, with the similarity in the names and the date of birth, and we have that issue right there. And then patient identification and real-time lookup into our systems as our patients crossed our system as a whole. Um, the lookup and identification of the patient, even with government IDs and the such, we get it wrong. I mean, let's face it, all of our organizations get it wrong at some point in time, which on the back end results in your denials. And if you don't work your denials fast enough, quick enough, um, you don't get paid for those. So this technology affords, once you seed the database in a very methodical and well thought out process and way, you end up, okay, somebody presents to your ED that's unconscious, we're actually going to treat on the real medical record potentially because we have their palm vein and it identifies them immediately um, if they come in as a Jane Doe or a John Doe. So we actually are using the medical record that it belongs to that patient and its history versus creating a new medical record because we just don't know who they are. They didn't come in with any uh, that. So there's a safety point, there's a, there's a patient satisfaction point, uh, and then there's a reimbursement side that actually rounds out the whole thing to make sure that you're all right and that we're doing the best patient care that we can as well as fiscally being responsible to the organization. Is, is an element of the reimbursement issue um, preventing fraud? Is, was that an implication of what you were saying? Part of it is to prevent, uh, prevent, yes, insurance fraud, and part of it is to present and make sure that you know we identify the right patient based on our, our lookup process in, in either system. And then it reduces your denial. So th there is that fraudulent part to it that you know we all have to acknowledge that it is there. And you're, you're referring to somebody basically trying to use someone else's insurance? To Using other, other insurance, you know, I mean, you do, we do have them present and say, you know, well, I don't have my government ID today. Um, and, you know, most healthcare organizations aren't going to say to you, you know, you didn't have your ID, you got to go home. We're not going to take care of you. You do the right. best case scenario to identify them, get them in the system, and, you know, provide them their care. Um, you know, there's a different law that uh, uh, takes care of that in EDs. You know, you can't turn away patients in EDs, but most healthcare organizations have that option, but we don't do that. I mean, that's that's mm -hmm. not the business. We're in the year to take care of patients. So, yes, there's, there's, there's a part of it that is addressing that as well. Okay. All right. Uh, Dan, you want to talk a little bit about the solutions, the biometric solutions that you're seeing working well in the clinical workflows? I'm sure, but I, ha I have to start off by saying that we were not really using biometrics in our clinical workflow, um, and we've chosen entirely to concentrate our biometric event for now um, upon patient registration. Um, and okay. we did that uh, for similar reasons uh, Arthur just spoke of. Um, it's really about patient safety. It's really about positive ID. Um, I don't have a terribly big issue with fraud um, in that the county in which I live tends to have um, a highly insured population. Um, but we're really looking for a solution that was going to streamline registration, reduce our capacity to create uh, duplicate medical records, um, mm -hmm. and that is more a function of 
people not uh, and process, not, not, not the patients coming through the door, um, um, and, and a way of just enhancing our level of safety and security around the patient record. We mm -hmm. chose to move forward with an iris um, scanning process, um, figuring that um, finger, uh, fingerprints and uh, uh, palm geometry was um, a little less reliable than iris over a long period of time. So since we're looking at a longitudinal lifetime record, um, iris seems to be the only tool or the best tool in the, in the toolkit um, that will maintain a positive ID um, from about six or seven months through the rest of your life. Um, so we, we chose that method. We also felt it was non-obtrusive. We didn't have people touching things or putting their hands on things, and it would give us a more streamlined workflow. But our effort is entirely upon patient registration um, and patient safety. Okay, uh, a couple of follow-ups there. Um, does the iris uh, issue, does the iris type of biometric produce uh, have any challenges not associated with palm vein or fingerprint that you're aware of? Um, it, well, the uh, the challenges are a little bit. There's a little pushback from some of our patients in having their photo and their iris uh, uh, image taken. Um, but on a technology-wise, it's really pretty straightforward and, and easy to use. What we liked best about it um, is that it really was not intrusive. You didn't have to touch anything. You didn't have to hold anything. The patient didn't have to do anything but sit in the chair and look at, at the registrar. Um, so <laughs> far, it's been, it's been very effective for us. So I'm guessing some of them uh, uh, just think you're doing more to them than taking their picture. It's just a little nerves there. Just a little nerves, yeah. But yeah. I can, but can you imagine what it would have been like if I was trying to do fingerprints? Um, I think there would have, probably would have been a larger pool of resistance. Um, but even the, the, the number of people that have objected to it um, has been very small. And of that number uh, that commented on it, uh, there's only been a handful of people that refused. And we really accept that and recognize that as as, as valid and, and move forward. I'd love to hear their reasons, right? Yeah, I'm, you know, we didn't really get into their reasons, but <laughs> I'm sure they're I'm sure they're widespread and varied. Yeah, I, well, I also think, know, you know. Go ahead, go ahead, Art. Yeah, I think uh, much to Daniel's point. I mean, you're gonna you're in, the, the the biggest I think reasons that we you know I see I see you know in in various articles is that you know they take my fingerprints for um, you know criminal purposes you know we're looking at iris and vein scanning of the palm which is not used in those contexts is in general so I think there's a little bit of the marketing that you have to do with your patient base which I'm sure Daniel's done but one of the biggest things that you know much to this point. Um, when we did our biometrics for uh, the drug distribution systems and, and the staff uh, process, we had significant union issues from the nursing unions, from the provider unions, um, and had to negotiate that in order to put this technology in here that we weren't actually using it for other purposes and everything like that. So, you know, let's take it away from the patient and put it back into your healthcare workers. They will articulate a serious concern through their unions and such like that if you do have them about this over the future uh, of this technology and how it gets rolled out. We saw it. We had to negotiate it. It was a significant sticking point in our rollout that we had to sit down and negotiate with everybody. Yeah, not to belabor the point, but um, I, I did uh, some fingerprint processing and photographs of, of uh, of, of patients and employees uh, about 10 years ago in a highly urban um, environment. Um, and I had significant protests from both my workforce and from our patient population um, around that technology, which is one of the reasons why we chose to go in a different direction today. And what's the concern, that you're sharing it with law enforcement or something like that? Well, on our patient side, particularly in our, in our urban environment, that was very much the concern. No, I don't want you to have my fingerprints. You're going to share it with the police department. Mm -hmm. um, on, it, on our it's a valid concern. 
and it's valid. It, it's a reasonable concern, except at the time, the technology was not a fingerprint technology. It was really a finger mapping technology. Exactly. Um, so there was nothing I really could share. But I, I don't expect the non-initiated um, to understand the difference between mapping and printing. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I recognized that that was a, a concern, and we offered, you know, we had a process and offered the patients the ability to opt out of doing that. All right, let me ask you about these, these union issues you confronted. Um, any advice to our listeners who are at hospitals looking to roll this out? Any warnings, words of advice on how they can uh, get over that challenge? Sure. Um, you know, you know, prior to going into not even picking the technology, the technology is what it is. It's going to be at the organization, and they have to practice with the technology. But I think engaging them into the discussion, much to what Daniel just said, was about really what is the technology. It's mapping technology. It's not taking your fingerprints, storing them on a server, and then something happens and we have to submit those to law enforcement or you know, to the NSA or something like that ridiculous. The fact of the matter is, is they really were interested in what the technology was doing, when it took your fingerprint, and how it was going to be utilized and where it was going to be stored. And then once we got over that explanation and the hurdle, which by in hindsight we should have done up, up front and explained the workflow and how it would actually help them from an overall perspective, we were able to get by that and it was an understanding. But coming out verbally and saying, you know what, we're gonna, you know, your passwords in the system are going to be fingerprint, so you're going to put your finger down here, you've got to go to the pharmacy, you've got to enroll, and you do you scan your finger and scan an alternate finger. Um, that right there, you know, ultimately starts the wall to come up in front of people and go, why do you want my stuff like this? Why do you want it to be so personal? So I think getting mm -hmm. around explaining the technology is the best case scenario. Thank you. Very good. Um, Dan, Art, Art mentioned uh, rolling it out to employees of the health system first. I don't know um, if, if that helps you identify issues that, that you might then be able to um, have, have taken care of when you roll it out to patients. Does, does that make sense to you? I'm not sure what the question is, Anthony. To roll out we, to... We, 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 we opted not to move forward with our employees um, because we currently have a technology in place, a tap-and-go card technology with a PIN or password um, that's working very well for our workforce. So mm -hmm. we tied it on to, to our employee ID. You're required to have that when you're, when you're at work. Um, it provides, you know, tap-and-go functionality. It moves the session as you move devices. So it's a process that's both in place and effective um, for our workforce. So we didn't want to mess with that, um, but we did understand that we had a challenge around patient identification and consistency in patient identification. So chose to put the effort and the dollar resources um, in that in in that model of care um, first. Okay, very good. Art, were you suggesting that, that rolling out biometrics and using your employees as a sort of a test group uh, before going to patients, was that what you're saying? Uh, no, actually, no, it was kind of misconstrued there, which is, which is fine, and I kind of muddled my, my words my fault. together. Bas basically what I was thinking about is, you know, explaining to it, obviously, clearly, your front end staff and everybody that is engaged with the patient needs to understand and have a scripted, unified explanation of why and what this information uh, will be collected for and how it's going to help them. So I think that marketing campaign, if you have a marketing department or anything like that, can put together along with your provider of this, can actually put this together so that you have a patient explanation there. My more point was is if we use this technology with our internal staff, my point right there is to have a really very detailed, engaged discussion with them that we're going to use biometrics with the staff and you can avoid some of those issues there. I think your staff will support that in the clinics or, or wherever you decide to use it for your registrations as long as they understand as well the marketing and, and what it's going to do for everybody and safety and patient satisfaction. But from an internal systems perspective, that was more my comment. Okay, very good. Uh, all right, let's move on to our next question. I want to start with you, Dan. Um, and we maybe already touched on some of this, but reluctance amongst clinicians. 
overall about the use of bio. And you said, I'm sorry, so let me start with Art, because Dan, you said you haven't rolled it out there yet. But Art, um, reluctance among the clinicians for any reasons we haven't addressed. Um, just, you know, just those those concerns about the technology, what are you physically doing with that technology um, mm -hmm. in general? But from a, but if we're taking the solution about palm vein and similar biometrics like that, um, there's, there's the concern on the providers and the front end staff and the people that are having FaceTime with the uh, patients that they have adequate information. Their concern is that how do I explain this to the patient because I know I'm going to get questioned. So having somebody able to do that at, at the point of contact with the patient when it first starts and explain that whole process uh, in multiple languages in some of our, our, our provider areas, as well as um, your providers are well versed in that so that, you know, somebody in that exam room is going to have a conversation and say, I'm still really worried about this. Uh, I'm still really worried about how, you know, um, you know, what's going to happen to this data and everything. If your provider who is trusted by the patient to be out and taking care of them from a holistic standpoint, they can explain to them what it's going to do for them and save them and, and potentially down the road. I think that's the engaged conversation that you need to have your staff ready to go for patient biometrics. Very good. So if I, if I can right. pick up on that, go ahead, Anthony. Dan. Please. Yeah, Art, Art, Art is, 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 is very, very on target with that. Um, with our iris scanning program, we actually took it out into the community at a variety of health fairs um, and, 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 organ, and, and like an urgent care opening and gave the community the opportunity to pre-register. That is to, you know, let us scan their, let's take their photo and scan their irises. Um, and we're able to create a marketing campaign about, you know, helping to keep your patient data more secure. Um, and a lot of our community got that, understood that, and, um, you know, were kind of, uh, and, and got in line to register and do this even before they had a physician visit or a visit in our ED. Um, so it really is all about the marketing. It's all about the communication. And it's all about having that trusted relationship uh, with either the health system or your care provider. Um, that seems to be the differentiator in those that elected to move forward and those that were reluctant. Dan, Dan I definitely hear a common thread um, that we hear with a lot of projects in healthcare and probably other industries to be successful, engaging the users or the customers um, as early as possible, communicating, explaining, educating before rollout. Um, and, and, you know, we, we covered this many times with EHR selection, engaging the clinicians, having them pick the system. But there's some commonalities to rolling out biometrics uh, that go with rolling out any system or doing any large projects where you're trying to get people to change the way they've done things previously. Is that correct? Um, yeah, I believe that's, that's absolutely correct and, and, and right on target. We are asking people to engage differently, um, maybe better, maybe worse, and that's a, that's a perception issue. But at the end of the day, we're asking people to do something that is different. I think when you do that, you owe that community, that cohort of individuals, um, an explanation and understanding and the ability to make a choice where appropriate. Um, to move forward with something. So a common three theme, um, and I think it's a theme that we see over and over on any technology um, effort uh, to a large, large group of people. Or, you know, change in and of itself, even if there's absolutely no negatives, is hard for people. Just to, to, you do it this way, now you do it that way. But now we have change with some possible concerns, these privacy issues you mentioned. Um, there may be nothing to it, but it's just explaining to, to people without getting too technical, as Dan mentioned, the difference between finger mapping and fingerprinting. You know, you don't want to go there, um, but you want to explain these things before the rollout, right? Yeah, you always want to, you know, you want to get ahead of the curve or ahead of the concern uh, as best you can, uh, especially with the new technology. The, the sooner you get ahead of it, the sooner you put it in the context of an understandable um, 
presentation that you know doesn't get down into the weeds, but is also at the same time reassuring to the uh, the user base. You, the better off you are. All right, very good. We're going to go with our put our first poll out there now, and I added um, another choice based on what Art was saying. So uh, when you see the poll open now, you'll see choice C is privacy. I'm sorry, reimbursement slash fraud. So that poll's open now. You can pick all of those. I just want to get an idea of what people are thinking of when we when we generally think of the use of biometrics. Um, you know, do you primarily think of it as a privacy security solution, the patient safety solution, or reimbursement slash fraud solution? Um, so if you want to take take a moment to answer that, and we'll come back and review those results in a moment. Um, and now we're going to have a discussion sort of related to that. So, um, Art, let me start with you. Do you think hospitals have to think differently about biometrics focused on security versus, versus patient safety, and now we could add in versus sort of registration reimbursement? So from a security standpoint, I mean, you're almost not going to end up with any breach data out there that would be useful for anybody, so let's just take that right off there uh, from the, from that perspective, should you have a breach. Um, from a security perspective, as far as, um, you know, identifying uh, patients adequately and avoiding the fraud, which is, you know, quasi-security based, um, you do have a definite hand in the upper right corner on this one because it actually will help, you know, not only, you know, uh, your patients, uh, from a personal perspective, it helps the organization avoid, you know, any fraudulent charges or anything like that as well. So from a security perspective, you could dovetail it into that, but um, I don't see any outwardly facing um, use of that data since we're really not grabbing the images and how they would manipulate that. I, I don't see that as a concern. Dan, what are your thoughts on this question? You know, I think, um, you know, biometric security is really the next logical step in an age when passwords um, and smart cards just aren't cutting it anymore. Uh, and we're at that point where we need to differentiate whether it's the holy grail or still a fledging technology. Um, and I think it's probably a little bit of both. Um, in, in moving forward, we need to use this technology in methodologies that are non-obtrusive, um, that are affordable, but it has to cover both sides of the realm. It's got to be about patient safety and security and secure, securing patient health information. Um, and it's got to be for better identifying um, the patient population and the employee. So we've got that security side where we know that biometric data has a tendency to be more secure, but it's not perfect, um, and then respond to the need to heighten the level of security around patient-centric uh, data. Um, so I think it lives in, in both, both, both worlds, um, and uh, I think it's here to stay. And you know, yeah, I, I agree with Dan. Or, I do. Or, yeah, I do agree. I do agree with Dan. And um, you know, from a uh, from a technology standpoint, I know internally we've struggled for our internal systems on biometrics, much to what Dan said for authentication or, you know, your proximity cards or items such as that. We do have certain people that their fingerprints, f for a physiological standpoint, will not work at all on the readers of the technology, uh, only because they've been worn down or something's happened to them in general, or sometimes even the temperature of hands causes the problem. We've seen that sporadically, not a huge process across the organization, but we do have that to where we need a backup for them to actually authenticate. All right, very good. Let's look at our, um, our poll results. Uh, and we see, if you should see the results on your last 70%, um, think of biometrics uh, dealing with privacy and security, 40% patient safety, and 20% reimbursement. So the majority, I mean, the, the most, the largest degree is privacy security. And Art, I think that reflects what you were saying when answering the question. Yeah, I, you know, it, there is a huge, there is a 
there's a significant tie to that era, that area of those three topics in general. Um, I think you know it'll reduce, like like the poll says, some of the reimbursement stuff. The patient safety, I think, is a big thing. If we can get past the education and the embracement of the technology by the patient base, uh, and disconnect that from anything from a law enforcement action or you're collecting my data to use later, I think once we get over that hurdle, I think you know your privacy and security. It's going to help both from your internal staff if we use it for staff authentication, as well as your you know your patient base and the fraud base. All right. Uh, Dan, any thoughts on that? Um, again, I think Art and I are being pretty consistent. Um, I do want to emphasize or accentuate um, that as improved as security and privacy uh, can be with biometrics, um, biometric devices are still um, vulnerable to spoofing attacks so that in the creation or utilization of any biometric device, we have to also make sure that we're including, you know, certain countermeasures and procedures um, to help validate and substantiate and support the biometric data that's, be, that's being captured. Um, felt it important to get that out um, in, the, in the discussion because we haven't really touched upon that yet. Yes, it's better. Yes, it's more secure. Um, but again, it's still, it's still not perfect. And I think we're going to start to see as biometric devices become more and more embedded in our workflow um, an increase in attacks against those biometric devices looking for a way to, uh, to breach or capture data. All right, I got to hear from you on that one as a CISO. Um, I firmly believe that any technology has the potential for a breach. Um, the, the breaching people, if you will, or the, the bad actors across the board are becoming more organized, they're becoming smarter. They move far faster than most development and or safeguards as we consistently prove in the media across the board. Um, as they become more organized and they become uh, smarter about this technology or use it, they will certainly use this as a vector into the healthcare system. I mean, you know, if we're using HVAC systems to get into systems such as uh, a one breach over last year that was rather large, they're certainly going to find the vectors to this. There's certainly going to be a vulnerability that we're going to consistently have to address. So, you know, they are, you know, I don't want to give them too much credit, but you have to have uh, a healthy respect for the technology and its vulnerabilities. Okay. So while we, we may be making improvements, we still can't um, go to sleep, so to speak. Correct. I would never go to sleep. Uh, I don't <laughs> think on any technology from a CISO standpoint uh, and, and, and that. Okay. Can I see on, on, on the other point, Art, I want to throw as much technology out there so that I can get a good night's sleep. Um, so hopefully there's a happy place between there for you and I. I hope yeah, so. Be <laughs> because, and this is the other thing that came to mind, Dan. There's a million things that you could spend your money on, right, your budget. There's a million things on your to-do list, you know, that are coming through your governance process and prioritizing. And yet, you know, you're, you're doing something with this um, biometric stuff. So. There's a real issue there that this is potentially addressing. Am I right? I mean, you're, you're not doing things, uh, you're not throwing money around for no reason over there. No, no, we felt that there was a, um, that there was a real need um, to reduce our number of duplicate medical records, which was somewhere in the neighborhood of 13, 14% on an annual basis. Mm -hmm. um, but that poses for us a serious patient care issue. If the mm -hmm. wrong data is getting into the wrong chart, um, or the right data is getting into the wrong chart, um, I have a potential issue here. And identifying that patient positively 100% um, of the time um, is really one of our, criti uh, our, our critical um, steps forward. As we look to consolidate a variety of electronic medical records that we have within the organization, um, as we look to streamline workflow and make it simpler, easier, faster for people to use and access, 
um, being able to get a positive identification of the person the minute they step through the door um, is, is really important for us. And that's why we chose to, to concentrate some effort on it this year. Very good. All right, let me ask you uh, this one. Do you know if any fingerprint biometric reader can be used for electronic prescription prescribing of controlled substances? You can have biometric readers uh, on your endpoints in order to handle that. Yes, you can. Um, okay. As long as you're, you know, it's 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 some of your dual factors. So yes, um, by federal law, you can actually, you know, that can happen. Okay. Very good. Um, Dan, you're uh, you're into science fiction. What do you <laughs> what do you think the future of biometrics looks like in healthcare? Well, you know, Anthony, if we stop and look at the variety of biometric um, use uh, methodologies that are out there, it's really quite um, quite extensive. So, if we look at biometrics as something that finds some unique physical or behavioral trait, there are biometric devices out there that look for DNA, that look for patterns in the blood vessels in your ear, iris, retina, facial scanning, finger scanning and printing. Uh, there are tools out there that will look at your gait to identify you, the way you ambulate. Um, you know, hand geometry, there are biometric devices around odor, um, vein and voice. and so it's out there. I imagine as the technology becomes more embedded in our daily use and cost comes down, we'll see a proliferation of any number of those devices out in the community. So looking towards that minority report kind of world. Yeah, right. So it's right, just right. got some really cool <laughs> factors and some really scary factors. And right. I'm not sure how I'll feel upon it until I have to deal with it. Right, right. Art, thoughts on the future? Well, I think you're going to see it um, proliferate through uh, healthcare, other technologies areas. I think that we are actually going to see it um, with infusion pumps and, and, and items such as that for authentication and changing the drip rates, you know, um, reporting back to the EHRs in those regards. I think you're going to see it on those mobile devices uh, on a regular basis. I think you're going to definitely get away from, you know, the bedside devices that we use now of actually logging into, um, you know, your host application and you're actually going to use something you know, as a fingerprint recognition on that like we currently do with some smartphones. And it's going to integrate into the app at that point in time so that they're not putting in their password. It is authenticating back to, you know, your EHR and things like that. I think you're going to see that so that they're not scanning a badge, tapping something. I think you're going to see that across the board. I think it's going to just keep getting uh, bigger and, and, and a larger database of use. Very good. All right. Let's get our, our second and final poll question out there. Um, opening the poll now, this is a single answer, so single select answer. Have you implemented any form of biometric security in your health system? And if you're an uh, affiliate with a health system or a consultant, uh, just give us your best impression of what you see going on out there. Um, yes, fully implemented, no investigating, no, have not started investigating. So as you're answering that, I want to thank uh, and read a little bit about our sponsor, Improvata. Um, and we do appreciate their support today in making this event possible. Improvata provides healthcare organizations globally with a security and identity platform that delivers authentication management, fast access to patient information, secure communications, and positive patient identification. Improvata enables care providers to securely and efficiently access, communicate, and transact health, patient health information to address critical compliance and security challenges while improving productivity and the patient experience. For more information, please visit Improvada.com. So um, go ahead, uh, finish up the poll question. I'm going to, uh, we'll get to that in a moment. There's 18, 17 seconds. We have a countdown as people finish. And um, so the results of the poll question, um, we are seeing a big opportunity for biometrics out there as we have a zero on the fully implemented, yes, fully implemented 
50% are investigating and 50% have not started investigating. So does that surprise you, Art, that we don't have any, well, you said you're starting your pilots, so I guess you would also not fall into the fully implemented category. Uh, no, not at all. Um, it's going to be, uh, I anticipate, you know, a, a positive uh, experience, uh, mm -hmm. as I always do, so um, I'd be happy to report later on uh, how that experience went, but I'm not fully in implemented. No. So the results don't surprise you. Dan, do they surprise you at all? Uh, not at all. I said we've been spending some time on this this year. Um, we are live in our emergency department, but have still to deploy throughout our physician practices and our acute care environment. So not at all surprising. Okay, very good. Um, interesting question, I think, here. Uh, there have been predictions, and we see these reports from time to time with, with uh, large numbers. Um, that the, the revenue from biometrics will grow in healthcare from 250 million in 2015 to 3.5 billion in 2024. That's a long way out. Um, but I want to ask you, let me start with you, Dan. Do you think you see things like this all the time? Do they affect your thinking perception strategy at all? Um, they do not, Anthony. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I, I, cause I think you can look at any industry, particularly any technology industry, and expect, you know, some level of growth over a period of time. So what I really want, what I really look to is not so much the predictions on growth, um, but how easy is the technology to use, how easy is the technology to integrate, and how does the technology simplify um, my workflow. Um, so those are, those are, those are more, have more of an impact in the way I think um, and plan than whether, than whether or not a particular technology is going to have exceeding growth. Of course, I would not necessarily dive into a product that's in a ne negative growth spiral, <laughs> um, but um, um, the, dollar, the dollar piece for me has to be secondary to the function. Right. So, Art, you're not using these kind of stats in a, in a board meeting to get buy-in? Uh, no, not at all. Because um, <laughs> much to Dan, much to Dan's, uh, you know, there there is those three key things that he mentioned uh, earlier on in his comments that um, it has to improve. You know, ultimately the workflow and the security and and the functionality across the board. Because y you know, from this day and age, we're becoming completely electronic, especially in our healthcare world, which requires, you know, uh, the famous comments of, I've got too many clicks, stop making me click on everything. So if we start to enhance um, the workflows and make it easier and more secure and integrated, that's what's going to drive us and our adoption rates. That's what's going to save, you know, can you save me time? Can you make me more efficient? That All of that is going to be the driving factor of it. Uh, and those are the selling points versus, you know, the $3.5 billion here that we have by 2024. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a ways out, like I said. All right, I just want to remind our audience, if you have any questions, uh, now's the time. Send them in in the Q&A box. Leave the default set to all panelists. Um, and I just want to get some final thoughts at this point. So, Dan, you want to start off? Any any final thoughts on advice for your for your CIO colleagues here? Uh, my advice is always find something that's really cool to do. Um, embrace a technology that's a little different and a little variant if it has the potential to improve your workflow and your user experience. Um, and I think once you've done that, it's an easy process to integrate into your strategy and your budget. Um, and I encourage people to do that as much as they possibly can. It's by experimenting and playing with the new technologies that we really find ways to improve patient safety and enhance the experience our employees are having. Great. Art, final thoughts? You know, overall, I think we're in a good position, you know, organization-wide here at Cambridge Health Alliance. But I think from an industry standpoint, I, you know, we're moving towards embracing new technology. We're moving towards enhancing technology that improves patient care, that improves patient throughput, and allows us to address, you know, the needs of our, our, our population and each one of our organizations. And this, 
you know, integration of device, biometrics, and all of that combined together can certainly deliver that to, you know, our constituent base. And I think that we just got to keep moving forward in healthcare and uh, the providers of that technology and embracing new stuff and trialing new stuff, and we'll get to a better place overall across the board. And, and it's a win-win, I think, for everybody across uh, the industry. Fantastic. Well, that's about all we had time for today. When you close out your WebEx window, you're going to see a post-event survey pop up. If you could take a, less than a minute to answer that, we'd appreciate it. I want to thank our panel very much, our, my good friend Dan Moriel and Art Ream, uh, for joining us, uh, being uh, sort of regular participants in, uh, in our programs and really helping out with their lessons learned. I want to thank our sponsor very much, Improvada, for making the event possible today. As I mentioned, you'll receive an email when our archive recording has been posted to our YouTube channel. For those of you who have the CHIME CHCIO certification, attending our webinars gets you one CEU. Please let CHIME know you were here, and if you've asked us to do so, we certainly will. Sponsorship opportunities, you can contact Nancy Wilcox, and if you need a certificate of attendance for another CEU program, you can see the final slide. And please go to our website to view our upcoming webinar schedule. So with that, I want to again thank Dan, Art, Improvada, our attendees, and everybody have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you, Thanks. Anthony. Take care.